Hi, and welcome to this uh, final free conference unlimited webinar. Uh, my name is Nico Leppanen, and today I'm joined by uh, a very lovely couple, uh, Rudy and Jenny Kennard. And, um, you know, for those who don't know, Rudy and Jenny have, or are they are the co creators of the Three Principles Movies website, which is this huge um i don't know like a research page for for videos and also sort of materials for for you know around this understanding and also they they run retreats and they organize workshop and they do some um facilitator trainings for people who are interested in learning more about uh to treat principles understanding so welcome Rudy and Jenny. Thank you. It's oh, lovely to be here. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Um, yeah, can you just like I said a few things about you, but maybe like you could talk a little bit more about yourself and your background and, and what you do. That sort of thing. Well, I guess just briefly, um, we came across this understanding, well, I came across this understanding about 11 years ago when um, Dr. Roger Mills and the late Sydney Banks came over to England to share this understanding in trained facilitators. So to my knowledge, I think that was the first course in, in England, well, Europe at the time. And it was interesting because at the moment we're on holiday and we visited a friends group up in um, Keswick in the Lake District and there's about 25 people in a room kind of talking about the principles. And it kind of reminded us of how it started in Europe. We were in that, that tiny little group like in London and how it's just ballooned everywhere since then. It's, it's, it's spreading so quickly. And what we really wanted to do this is now going back six years ago there was nothing online you know there was a couple of personal sites but there was no real resources there's no research online there wasn't any access to social maps or communities so we created three principles movies.com website in attempt to share this understanding with with the wider world really um and it was interesting because once we kind of got it going, we got emails from all over the world from people who could finally, for the first time in Three Principles history, see other people talk about the Three Principles, apart from the people they could physically go and see. And so since then, it's really ballooned and we run facilitator trainings in England and courses um, and just generally kind of enjoying, just enjoying a simple life, as simple as we can make it at least. <laughs> Yeah, and and what what kind of like, of course, like starting, you know, there, as you said, there's nothing online at the time. Obviously, at the, like six years ago or something like that, I I knew nothing about this, so I don't know how it was was like at the time. But you know, you, you, there was nothing online, and and you you had an idea for creating something like this. How did you come about? Kind of like, I think I had a friend at the time who was a devout skeptic and he was saying well where's the research where's the transformational stories because Roger Mills the first teacher was talking about these miraculous transformations in communities like one of them which we visited had at some stage the fourth highest homicide rate per capita in the nation that's Lockwood Gardens in California and there's been zero homicides since the project started 15 about 15 ago. to 20 years ago um and the police officer got awarded the california peace prize it was on seven network news channels but again there's nothing online to prove it so he was saying well where's the research you know how do you know that this works so i kind of thought well i want to get this out there i want to kind of have almost proof <laughs> that this is hugely important for humans evolution for humanity's evolution and personal transformation and so i mean apart from that that's kind of more my ego wanting to kind of prove something but it was more of a case of this had such a transformational effect on on myself and jenny and then jenny's family and then other people that i knew i thought this is probably the best kept secret and worstly marketed understanding in the world so 
it kind of needed a bit of a kickstart to try and get it out there. Um, it certainly doesn't need that anymore, so we're kind of stepping back from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned that you know you, you started to like people started to like I assume that once you know everything was online and all that you got invitations to come to all over the world really to to do all sorts of things and then uh well is that what happened <laughs> well the funny thing was we were facilitators but then we learned videography and web design so we could get it out there and then people kind of saw us as as videographers rather than facilitators so we kind of shot ourselves in the foot as far as our own personal business but I think people are kind of starting to acknowledge you know great work but we were facilitators before videographers <laughs> yeah. well um well certainly now you've been invited to to, to many places and, and and most recently or I, I don't know if this was the most recent trip you've made but um was it like two months ago or something you you were invited to nepal um by someone could you first of could you tell us a little bit about like how did you end up there it was weird we were actually on the way down to london um for the uk conference and i was getting back to emails that had come through in the week that i hadn't got back to and one of them was from a lady in nepal who um told us that um it was very brief how she said it, but she said in the middle of the first earthquake, she was terrified. And then she said she doesn't know why, but it just occurred to her, this line that she'd read in a book a year or so before, if your feeling comes from thought in the moment. And that was the only thing she'd read in the book, and she'd been like, yeah, whatever, put the book down. And she said in that moment when she saw that, she fell into a deep feeling of peace and she experienced the rest of the earthquake and the aftershocks and then two weeks later another earthquake with a feeling of peace and we were kind of amazed because even though we've, we've been sharing this and been around it such a long time it seemed like for such ex an extreme circumstance oh it's still true then that our experience is coming from within um, so I emailed her back and just thanked her and said, if there's anything we can do to support you or help other people that you know get this out into Nepal, please let us know, even if you want us to come out there. Just like a throwaway line. And then she emailed back and said, if you could come out, it would be amazing. But maybe wait a month for the aftershocks to, to slow down. So it was kind of, it happened in an instant of just... And I think that's the thing I love about the principles of my own understanding is that I'm very open to things changing and the spontaneity and all that you're just kind of more in the moment and when she said would you come would you actually come out i thought yeah we would because it's not that there's not people here that need it but at that time it was support was needed there mm -hmm. and this seems like such a foundational understanding that it felt a privilege really to be able to go out there and in lots of ways we felt we learned just as much from the people we were sharing with and they, they learned from us. It was it was a really a two-way thing because you saw what we share in the classroom and you saw it in action because there was an aftershock still when we were there and you just saw the resilience of the human spirit. So it was kind of um, not expected, very last minute, but definitely a really worthwhile a project to be part of. And it's nice now because we've asked the wider community to support the project to continue so now they've got monthly webinars set up um, we've got a young girl who got hugely impacted by this mm -hmm. is working for us to arrange the webinars and um, there's been books translated now into Nepali so it feels like from one conversation through email and being open this whole new project has kind of started and it kind of feels like it could be bigger than when we started the movie site that's great. And I remember because I was at the conference as well at the, at the London conference and and you introduced this this idea, this project there that that you, you had been contacted by someone and invited to go there. And, and then you obviously it's it's uh, quite a big an investment, you know, like the, to travel there and everything. And, and then you um, it was all funded by charity, right? Like people could could uh, we set up a social funding site 
and I think we raised about six thousand pounds within two weeks. Two, mm. Yeah, within two to three weeks, we raised six thousand pounds, which paid for myself and Jenny and a colleague, Dave Ellery, to fly from Nepal and, and kind of paid our expenses for the month. And we've got some money left, which were then. Um, funding um joshna who's, who's one of the people that was impacted by this to kind of keep it going translate books um translate videos from the movie site organize a webinar so now that we've left there's one or two or three people there with a good enough understanding to kind of keep it going pretty much with with support from facilitators in europe and america so it's been um like Jenny said, it's it was a difficult experience, but such a worthwhile one. It really, because you, you, know, you can talk about resilience, you can talk about forgiveness, you can talk about compassion all you want, but until you're actually there at ground zero and seeing people who've been injured, seeing people who've had their, their children or family pass away with the earthquake and see, see how they're coping, see how they're getting on, it does something to you it, it kind of it takes like an idea from your head to a, a lived experience and again that's why Jenny was saying like for us seeing the resilience seeing the well-being of the people there was just it was just mind-blowing absolutely mind-blowing it wouldn't have been possible with I think that's again what I love about this community is we announced it at the conference. I think we were, we only had, the, you know, half a day left, and I think we raised about six or seven hundred pounds just by people put, throwing in cash into a box. And then within two weeks, we raised six thousand pounds. And I think it's a giving community because people see the benefit of it. They've seen it for themselves, and I think that's the wonderful thing about this is that everyone sharing has their own story and their own transformation. So. They, they they kind of they walk their talk and they know what it feels like to suddenly see this and what impact it has on your life and it seems everyone then wants to pay it forward mm -hmm. and allow other people to have this so it's it's a privilege to be part of such a wonderful community really yeah. so with what kind of groups did you share the understanding with in nepal the first week that we there we shared in a primary school and um that was interesting because I've had limited experience with very young children and she wanted us to work with the whole school um, over the over the few days. So we had from five to 13 year olds. So it was brilliant for my own understanding because it really was about simplifying and making fun and using metaphors and games. Um, so that was the first experience we had out there was with these young children. Um, and then we got to work within a community hospital um, with clients and people that worked there. And at that time we had a translator. So it's an interesting process again with the translator because there isn't direct translations for a lot of the stuff we were talking about. A lot of the words needed to be described. But the, the beauty of it was it, it does go beyond the language and we really saw that. So that was with the, the community. Then we did some stuff with business a few different businesses and um, we got to go out and vi uh, visit a village um, and, and speak with those guys and they're psychology students yeah then a group of psychology students which was amazing and then at the end we kind of got a group together who wanted to share more so we kind of said it was almost like the first training to help people who want to share this with others um, so that was teachers psychologists aid workers yeah, and then a lot of the stuff we also shared um, like audios with people who were then going back out into the villages and back out because we wanted to visit one of them, but it was about four days to get there through planes, hiking, um, and we were only there for a month. So in the end, we just gave lots of resources. And one of the transformations in this in, in the aid worker was phenomenal because he he wanted to help people, but he got so completely drained himself. And he could only really go out for about a month, uh, a week, and then he'd have to go back to Kathmandu and just recharge his batteries. And then we had this email um, through the lady who contacted us in Nepal, just saying that he was able to go back out there for a month and he was energized and he was coming up with new ideas and he wasn't draining himself. And he just said, I don't know what I heard on those audios, but I feel completely different. So it, it does seem that this, with the groups of people that we got to share with, 
it wouldn't be everyone that had those boom moments but it's like a trickle effect so it's going to be interesting over the next year you know months years to see kind of what what happens now in nepal and, and like what i'm curious about is how is it like you first went to talk to uh primary school kids and then you talk to psychology students and then you know health health workers and or aid workers and all that and and you know there's some very like, different groups from the outset so i'm interested in hearing how did you kind of like teach this to to these different groups like in what ways were were did the the, the audience um have an impact on how you sh share this well i think like water is fluid and if you freeze it it's a solid and if you heat it it's steam so you've got three states of the same element you know, it's just water but it's in different states and the three principles are like one simple truth that can be in all manner of different states it depends whether the room's warm cold or steam you know you share it depending on who you're talking to so with the children, we we're coming up with, um, I think I first saw this um, with, with Jack Pransky's lot up in near Canada in America. He's got kind of like, um, we got the kids to fill a, a jar of water, a jar up with water and they put glitter in it. They did the lid up. I think Jamie Smart uses like a glitter ball, I think he calls it. But with the kids, they kind of shook it. And kind of they got the metaphor that when your thinking's all over the place, you know, the glitter's all over the place. But when you just kind of put it down and leave it, it eventually just starts to settle to the bottom. And then it's clear. So we use this as a metaphor for how the mind works, that when we want to not, when we don't want to share with other children, if you don't want to behave in class, if you're, you know, confused, it's okay, you can just let it, play itself out and then act when you're feeling calmer we also use play-doh with the kids say that you know you can create out of play-doh anything you want you can make a tractor you can make a star you can make a tree but we're not stuck with what we've got we can actually mold it back into something else as a metaphor that we're not stuck with what we think we don't have to be these kinds of people that we can we have access to infinite potential. We can recreate ourselves moment to moment. I wouldn't have said it like that, obviously, <laughs> but we said it in the language of the children to understand. And then when we're talking with business, we're kind of talking, getting on board with how one state of mind affects one's productivity, how creative thinking is really helpful within a working environment. And then when we worked with hospital staff, we listened to what their problems were. And it was mostly about their main issue was trying to stop thinking about the horrific earthquake and worrying that another one's going to happen so we gear the principles around what they needed so again it's always sharing the same point but it's sharing it very differently with different words depending on the population that you're talking to but i think there's one thing is for sure is that it does whatever age or population or culture it does seem to reconnect people on a heart level to their innate intelligence their innate health to their natural capacity for well-being and resilience whether they're five-year-olds or whether they're you know 90 year olds and so it was great working with such a massive variety of populations and it's really good experience for us as well if you go to innate well-being um, innatewellbeing.co.uk about us you see um, video blog you can actually see all the video blogs we created and we interviewed the hospital staff we interviewed the psychology students we interviewed the children and they talk about what they got from the time with us and what they're seeing and how it's helpful um, so you can actually look at that and kind of get it in their own words which would be much more articulate than my version <laughs> Yeah, I wrote it on. I wrote the website on the chat box, so people can just click on that and go to see that. I actually watched. I think I watched all of your uh, video blogs from there, and and it was really uh, just like I don't know. Great to see how how they like when when you interview the 
for example, a school gate after after you know you spend some time with them and then you interview them and ask them, you know, so what did you learn? What did you experience? And and they was just like so clear on it. Yeah, this is like they, um, they, they, it's, I don't know for some reason it, it seemed like um, they saw it really quickly. They saw something really quickly. And it made total sense to them, and and, and for them, um, it wasn't. In a way, it wasn't a, a big thing, because sometimes, sometimes what I see and what I hear, sometimes like people contact me because I'm I've been writing about this and kind of talking about this here in Finland, and sometimes people contact me and and they tell me that you know they've been learning about this or or. This understanding they've been watching videos or, or something like that for six months or something like that. And but it hasn't helped them. Mm -hmm. Or it, it hasn't done a difference in their lives. And um and then you have someone someone who kind of like hears one sentence <laughs> and it changes everything. So um well, actually, given that you've been around this for for quite a while now, what would you say to someone who's who hasn't kind of been learning about this and and is curious, but then feels like it's not really making a difference to them? What what would you say? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> It's funny, my, the first um, course that I went on in London, I didn't really even know why I, what I was going to. I just went along with my sister. So I wasn't really expecting anything. I wasn't trying to change. I wasn't trying to get over things. I just, I was just bored, to be honest. I didn't have much to do that weekend, so I went with my sister. And it was incredible how much I got. And it quite often seems that when we're trying to get somewhere or get something, it completely eludes us because what the principles is uh, is showing us is how we're already working, how we're already operating. And there's nothing for us to do with that already present system. But I think as we learn about it, we are also the worst judges of what we're seeing and what we're not seeing. Because sometimes I know that people say, I haven't seen anything, it's not helped at all in my life. But then they'll give you they'll talk about something you're like well that's different because you're aware that was happening so before you were blindly getting lost in thought at least you have some consciousness some awareness that you're getting lost in thought so it can be quite subtle but i think we're very used to achievements and being able to check things off that we've got or changed and in a way it's this understanding has a way of working through us it's not through our will it's not through us trying. Some of the um, changes that happened to me were just, you know, I, I used to suffer with depression and eating disorders and those things fell away after those three days. But there's other areas, jealousy. I did not see this for a good few years. And that was the area I was thinking, well, why can't I see the principles in this area? And I gave it so much attention, it just got bigger and more annoying. And it, for myself, and from from the people I've worked with, it seems the less attention we give the areas in our life that we don't like, the smaller they get. And I think as soon as we focus on this is a problem, I need to fix it, what we think about, we feel. And I remember um, Rudy getting asked to go and do an event in America when I was going to be in Ireland. And I was like, oh my God, how exciting. It's brilliant. You should go and do that. And then after the call, I was like, Oh my gosh, I'm, why aren't I being jealous? Where's jealousy gone? Because that had been my constant companion for since I was very young, actually, and especially with boyfriends and things. Like, when did this thing that had completely consumed me fall away without me noticing? So it seems that the less we're trying to fix ourselves and work on ourselves, and we learn about something that's true for all of us, and how we work, the stuff that we don't like has a way of, of falling away or becoming smaller or we have a different perspective on it. But it's hard because we want something to be an achievement thing. 
we want to get rid of the things we don't like but this almost allows us to be more comfortable with where we are not wanting to get somewhere higher or or let go of these things you get more comfortable where you are right now because we've all got blind spots we've all got areas where we could see more so i feel like it just allows you to just be present in what what you're experiencing now without so much judgment and i haven't seen anyone who's been on courses and sort of stayed around this who hasn't benefited it may not be in the way that they wanted it to immediately but there's benefit that i've seen for anyone learning about this don't know if you'd say anything else yeah i think as a metaphor i don't know if, if the people listening are aware of something called a magic eye but it's like this picture and it's just like random colors and patterns and it doesn't look like anything but if you keep looking at it and defocus your eyes a 3d image pops up I don't know if people kind of seen those before, but I think when you focus with intensity on the three principles and treat it like an achievement model, you, not all the time, but generally you don't really get anything. I didn't get anything that I know of initially because I was really focusing on it like a laser. And at some stage during hanging around this, I kind of like relaxed about it and then when I wasn't focusing on the magic eye image, it's almost like a 3D image popped up and I wasn't even expecting it. So I saw something very, very deep, but it wasn't when I was, wasn't, it wasn't obvious when I was trying to see it. It's kind of like the universe has got a sense of humor in that respect. And so like with the facilitator training we run and all the courses, we're literally saying to people, treat this like a vacation like a holiday it's not a full-time job don't worry about it don't don't look at loads of videos and read loads of books just be around it gently because there's like i you know in another life i, I was a qigong instructor and i kind of learned martial arts and i learned how to be really powerful with relaxation like i could get people to push me when i was physically resisting them i could if someone was stronger than you they could push you over but when you really relaxed, they could push you. You just kind of moved with whatever direction they're going in. You just kind of moved in the other direction. They just couldn't push you over. This understanding is similar to that. And so almost if I've got someone intensely trying to get it, the first couple of sessions, I will literally be trying to get them to ease off the gas pedal, so to speak. Go enjoy their life. Do what they enjoy doing and just give up focusing with intensity on trying to get something because the the misunderstanding about this is that you can get the three principles you can't what you can do is get you can get a sense of them you can maybe get a feeling but you're never going to understand something before form you're never going to understand something that gives birth to experience. It's a spiritual understanding that has practical implications within our lives and we can't get it, but we can appreciate it and we can be grateful for it. And for me, I think, as I've come to understand this, I've relaxed a lot more about it. And there's a saying that says, angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. And my life and our relationship and everything is so much lighter and it's that lightness that lightness of being and so again i, I haven't really met anyone who hasn't been around the th who's been around the three principles and hasn't got anything there's lots of people who think they they haven't but when you question them more they do realize oh okay yeah i'm I, this happened to me and i didn't react in the same way i normally did because this works via subtraction it's almost like we're taught to we're taught addition we need to get this we need to learn that and we need to get bigger this humanizes us it humbles us it takes a lot of our minds it takes away a lot of our egoic thinking and we become less but when there's less of the self-importance less of the identity of oneself there's so much more room for love, 
for God in a non-religious sense, but there's so much room for this infinite potential behind life to flow through us and to move us kind of like an instrument in the wind we can play the most beautiful harmonies that can enliven other people's hearts as well so this has nothing to do with the self it has nothing to do with achievement it has nothing to do with trying to be a better person or trying to do things better it's a very simple paradigmatic point that allows people to a lot of their thinking to start dissolving a lot of the thinking gets less intense less heavy you trust it less and you do have more of a lightness to life and i mean the course we're doing is called effortless relationships we're not saying that because it's a good marketing thing to say it's actually true relationships can be really effortless and that's coming from a person who's had an incredibly poisonous upbringing, um, incredibly fracturous relationships and all manner of nasty things happening in my childhood. Like even my relationships with a perpetrator of those is really easy. That's not to say that they've changed, they haven't changed, but my experience of them has completely changed because I'm seeing that one single point of where all experience comes from. And to be honest, it for me, it, it opens your heart to a whole new world. It opens your heart to this infinite benign nature behind life. And as that starts to move through you, you do, you do fall in love with life. And people are part of life. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just having insights listening to you about like totally different things. This is this is this is why I really like to be in this conversation when you were just listening to someone talking about doesn't matter what, and then you see something that's not at all related to yeah. what the person was saying on all this sort of topic, but they're like, oh you know, it's like works the same way over there and there. Yeah, that's just beautiful. Um, you decided to, well, the topic, the title was the power of power, the power of paradigm shift. I think it was. What some people might be a bit curious about the word paradigm, and it gets kind of like thrown up around there a lot when you when you read books about about the principles or. Or you watch videos or, or whatever it's like people talk about paradigms different paradigms i yeah but i'm just curious to hear about like how do you understand that the word and, and also um yeah what is the paradigm it's funny when i first heard the term paradigm i i wasn't sure what it was i i mean i'd heard it but i wasn't really sure what it was and I think the simplest answer I have found has been it's the way in which something works. The paradigm is how something works. And it was really helpful for me um, when learning about the principles as a paradigm to hear about other paradigms. And it was interesting because there's been a time where we think we, we, we know the paradigm, we know how something works, and then we find out that it, we've been wrong. So one of the examples of that is when we used to live on a flat earth. So we all lived on a flat earth and there was lots of things in place um, with the um, ships to sail close to the shore and we had um, huge anchors and that's how we lived. There was things that were, were necessary when you lived on a flat earth. So as soon as we found out that actually we lived on a round earth, the true paradigm that we live on a round earth, our thinking changed because as soon as we know how something works, the way that it it doesn't work is revealed and falls away. So before the principles, I lived in a world where I thought the world affected me, circumstances affected me, I could be made to feel things. So to go on a course and hear that moment to moment, the only thing I can experience is thought. A thought created feeling within me and that's the same for every other human being on the planet I realized I'd been living in a false paradigm I thought the world worked the way that it didn't so when it was revealed to me how it actually worked 
so much thinking that I'd lived in became unnecessary. I didn't have to avoid certain people to feel okay. I didn't need to avoid certain situations for me to feel okay. I saw where my own experience was generated. I then saw that for other people. So there's huge implications to seeing a true paradigm. Mm. And I love it when it's spoken about, it's just the way that something works. It's that simple, it's not, because paradigm can kind of sound a bit, and it is thrown around, and there's things with the title paradigm that aren't really a paradigm. So to just say, well, this is how life works. We do live on a round earth, that's how, you know, that is, that's a fact. This is how we work, that's a fact, and it's constant. It doesn't change, it doesn't take holidays. It's a constant that we can live by. And I think there's something for us as human beings when we find a constant, it really changes us and evolves us. So I don't know if you would describe it any differently. Yeah. Yes. A false paradigm, meaning like a flat earth, or a false paradigm, meaning that we used to think that um, all the heavenly bodies rotated around the earth because it looks like that you look up in the sky and over time you see stars are moving so you just think well obviously we're stationary and the stars are moving so even though it's common sense and it does look that way it's still false because it's not true so when you come across as something that is true and it's a constant it's not even new paradigm it's a true paradigm it's very it's a very different discriminator there it's a truth it provides an indisputable, dependable, 100% discriminator to how, how it works. And I'll probably get hung up and killed for this, um, but psychologies, um, a lot of inquiries into the mind are based on things that aren't constants. They're based on concepts, ideas, and beliefs, and good ideas good ideas and beliefs and ideas and concepts are really good and they work sometimes but they don't work all the time so when you've got something that is always true all the time it does provide something that you can really rely on and so with the three principles as a paradigm i know that every experience i have of my wife of my experience of my finances of myself is coming from thought in the moment it's not coming from my wife it's not coming from my finances and the first time it really hit me is when we created three principles movies.com website we pretty much worked full time for two years without pay and we got in a lot of financial difficulty so bad in fact that we we're going to have to go bankrupt because none of it was funded it was basically funded off our credit card and i had so much worry in thinking about what it meant to be going bankrupt i was unsuccessful i was stupid i was unintelligent i was a waste of space for people paying their taxes etc etc and it came to the point where i I did everything I could to avoid going bankrupt and then in the end I couldn't help it because we're paying about £800 a month in interest on the credit cards. And I gave up trying not to go bankrupt, oh I'm just going to have to go bankrupt. And in that moment of relaxation I got a new thought and the new thought was, do you think you're unsuccessful to be willing to financially bank bankrupt yourself for the service of other people that you haven't even met? Do you think you're a failure to have created a resource that's helping hundreds of thousands of people around the world? And I was thinking, ah, oh, yeah, okay. I haven't thought that before, that's interesting. And all of a sudden I didn't feel a failure anymore. And I thought, that's it, success is giving to other people. And it's like, no, <laughs> success is whatever you think it is. Because I was holding success to be financially dependent, uh, financially independent, successful, having a big house, having these kinds of relationships, driving a nice car. I held that as success. And I didn't know it was thought created. I thought that was just what success was. It's predominantly backed up by everything you read in the media. But all of a sudden, what I was holding as a truth, I saw as thought. It's like, oh, success isn't that. 
because if you ask someone in South America in the jungle what success is to them, they wouldn't even know the concept of success. And so all of a sudden I was going to go bankrupt and I felt the most financially free I've ever felt in my life because I realized financial freedom has nothing to do with what you have and it has everything to do with what you think about what you have. And I realized I had a beautiful relationship with my wife. I had people who loved me and I just loved my life. Is that unsuccessful? So it wrote off my idea of success. And since then, with our business, we're, we're kind of fine financially, but I don't know why I'm telling the story. There's a point to it. I'm trying to find out now. But I realized that, oh, every experience is thought created. Every concept we hold is thought created, and it doesn't have to be true. And I think as well, it was seeing that there's nothing in the world that can make us feel something yeah and i think that had been your area where the principles hadn't trickled in yet because as soon as it came to money or finances well no that's real that really deserves worry yeah. that does work that way so suddenly you're going yeah there's two paradigms operating at the same time which is impossible yeah it either works one way or another way you can't be like pregnant and not pregnant at the same time <laughs> so it was almost like for you, it was that it was almost like the one that had eluded, me. eluded you. It'd been bl you'd been blind to it, and you're suddenly like, oh, even finances, it's true for that too. And I think, even though you would have said it's true in every area, we we have blind spots. Mm -hmm. So like my jealousy, it was like, no, really, if Rudy goes somewhere and I'm not there and I don't know who's there, and that's really real. That's making me feel jealous. And I kind of knew that wasn't true, but it seemed like it was true. So this is saying, well, moment to moment, what I'm experiencing is coming from within me. It's never going to be the outside world creating a feeling within us, even though it looks like it. Because if he just wouldn't do that, then I'd feel okay. But it's, I feel like suddenly with this, you get on board with how something actually works. So you can kind of go off and think it works another way, but not for very long before you're pulled back to that wisdom, that common sense. Because as soon as you know how something works, you also know how it doesn't work so it can't trick you for very long so i think that's its power it's constant it's always there it can be relied upon and it's self-correcting within us i think i used the example of um i used to watch a program that showed you how magic tricks worked and before you know how it works you're almost kind of thinking what well, this person has magic powers it looks so real but then as soon as you know how it works, you can't get tricked by it again because you know how it works. You'll kind of, you'll see the sleight of hand or you'll know that they've got a false thumb. Like you notice those things. So this is almost showing us as human beings how the magic trick works. So even though we can kind of get lost in the magic of it, we know how it works. So we're not going to think it's as real as it looks. Yeah, so there's one true paradigm and if I could put it into words, borrowing the words from Keith and Keith Levins of Alder Monroe, is that we're experiencing thought in the moment, not just sometime, but every time. Because the world can't be flat and round. Like it's, it's what, what is it? Well, it's round. It, there's, the, you don't have both. So it's not as if sometimes the traffic makes me feel angry, but other times it's my thinking about the traffic every single time it's my thinking it's thought in the moment giving me experience not just of my finances or of my relationships or the traffic but everything and people throw the term around the three principles oh it's just thinking and i don't necessarily like that because i think it's all thought it is all thought innocently it's all thought and for me, sometimes, you know, there can be people in, in my life who I wouldn't necessarily choose to hang out with. And in the past, they really bothered me or I wish I wasn't like that or they're, they're so know-it-all or they're so egotistical. And, and so because they're behaving like that, I feel like this. Well, most of the time they can do that, but I know where my experience is coming from. My experience is coming from my thinking about their behavior. It's not their behavior. 
And I'm not saying people don't behave badly. Yes, they do. But to another person, they can behaving and they could find it funny. To some other person, they could behaving and they can find it endearing. Another person can find it annoying. Like the only consistent thing about our experience is that it's always coming from our thought in the moment giving experience and never coming from anything outside of thought. And I know that may sound psychological and it can sound like it's not very impressive, but this involves a longer conversation, so I'll just say it briefly. Every single problem on this world is created from that one innocuous misunderstanding. Hum humanity does not, humanity is living in the dark ages of a flat world. As this understanding brings it to a round world globally, war, suffering, malnutrition, poverty, all of that is just a symptom of misunderstanding because when you think other people, the world, the government, the situation is making you feel something, you try and change it, you try and control it, you try and whatever you try and do, so personally and globally as humanity we wake up as individuals to this one simple truth it will literally be like heaven on earth because the only thing that for me and that we've seen from traveling around and filming this literally all over the world is the one common denominator that i see is people get in touch with their spirit or their hearts or their humanity their humane beings and as that starts to unfold people just can't behave like they used to behave they can't do it it becomes illogical their heart or their their humanity won't allow them to do what they've always done and so again i feel enormously grateful to share this for a living i mean i don't know what i've done to deserve it but <laughs> It's quite awesome. <laughs> and that brings us nicely to this weekend. <laughs> uh, so, so this weekend you will have an opportunity to share it with, with some people uh, who are coming to Finland, to Helsinki on Friday, and then you, you're going to be attending the Unlimited 2015 conference on Saturday and Sunday uh yeah what are you expecting from the weekend personally that's what i want to hear <laughs> I, I love going to conferences just to meet people and have conversations i'm really excited to listen to every all of the speakers because even though i've been around this 10 years i know that there's always more to be seen mm -hmm. like it's it's so weird that something so simple can be revealed to you again and again and again so I'm really looking forward to connecting with people, um, hearing people's stories, just being around people and being a student as, as well as someone who's sharing because we are all students to this. So I don't really know, I, I don't know what to expect um, about Helsinki, I've never been before. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't even, to be honest, it was about <laughs> two weeks ago, I was like, Rudy, there's a mistake on the website. It says that the conference is in Finland and he's like, yeah. It is in Finland, wasn't it? Like, Helsinki's in Norway. It's like, no, <laughs> it really isn't. <laughs> I'm actually going to a whole other country that I had no idea I was going to this year, which is exciting. <laughs> I can't believe I just admitted that. <laughs> My geography is. It's <laughs> endearing. Um, I am really looking forward to meeting my Finnish and other European brothers and sisters that I haven't met yet there because I just love connecting with people and. We're going to be around just, you know, obviously during the talks, but after talks, we can just connect and, and chat with people. Um, so I'm really looking forward to connecting with people there and meet them. And I don't know, apart from that, I'm really looking forward to the speakers. Um, and I just want to express my gratitude to Unico for organising it. I've, I've organised, well, we organise events ourselves, so we know the work involved and the determination and the perseverance and the marketing and the website and all of it is is a lot of work to do so i just wanted to express our gratitude and our thanks for you and your team to to get it all going um it's it's wonderful and i think i think sydney banks will be 
all so proud of what you guys are doing over there and what's happening around the world. Um, so yeah, I just want to express my gratitude. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, when you actually, when you were talking about the uh, when you created the website and and you kind of just uh, you had an idea, you decided to follow it, and you know this amazing thing emerged. You know, I really felt like yeah, that's that's kind of like what happened to me. I, it's like an idea for a conference, then decided to go for it and and see what comes out. And you know, there is there are obviously many motivations that well, I can find many motivations and and reasons, you know, why I want to do this. But in the end, it's just like I don't know. It's just like amazing to to have this. Um, I don't know, like a common experience around something with people who who um, I was just like I don't know what what really struck me when I when I went to the um, conference in London, the Tikkun conference for the first time this year. It's like people were just so open and comfortable in in their own skin, and 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 um, there was just this amazing atmosphere that surrounded the whole conference and and, and for the tr and I had a privilege I really felt like I, I was so privileged to be able to to be there for three days like how did how did how, like like you said like how did how did we find this from all the people that haven't and ha haven't already or haven't yet uh, come across this so yeah, that's just great. Um, I don't know really, is there anything else? This is the final webinar. I've been doing webinars with all the speakers during the past two, three months. And and this is the final one. Uh, usually we've been like at the end, we've been kind of promoting something like the, 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 the website of live attendance. Uh, oh yeah, one thing. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, we decided that we want to live stream the whole event as well. Uh, it was sort of like the idea was there, but then I wasn't sure about it. And, and then we kind of looked into it, how to make it, you know, what's the kind of, um, what's the way to, to make it possible that isn't too complicated or doesn't require doing a lot of high technical stuff. And we found a way to do it. And, and so, so I'm, I'm very like excited that, that people can watch the conference from their home, like wherever they are um, in the world, really. So, so do you have a, I think, I, so I'll put, I just posted a, a link to the, to the website where you can find information about how about the live streaming opportunity and you can have a look on that if that's something you, you're interested in and yeah nico yeah. Uh, we live stream a lot of our uh, retreats that we where we actually live stream all the retreats that we run and we've had such amazing feedback from people a lot of them said it's kind of like being in the room so if anyone's listening um, and are thinking about it, I'll definitely recommend go there in person. If you if you can physically attend, go in person because you get to meet everybody. You get to have conversations over over meals. You get to go for walks with people. You get to learn more because surprising the learning doesn't really. <laughs> I'll probably get shot for saying this as well, but a lot of the learning doesn't really happen when you're listening to the speakers. A lot of it is when you're just kind of hanging out with other people and having chats and connecting. But if you can't and you get the chance to attend via live streaming, again, it is really beneficial. And we've got an online facilitator training program and those guys are almost getting as much as the people who are physically attending. So I know it's live streaming, I know it's not as good, good as being there physically, but I really recommend it. It's you know, a wonderful experience. And one more thing I wanted to say is that obviously there are 
you know, Finland, the Finnish is in, or I, I'm not sure, I, I, I always get the, the time zones mixed up. I think it's like Greenwich plus three, something like that. So obviously if you're living in the States, California somewhere or in Australia or wherever, you know, there's a, a bit, bit of a time, time difference to Finland. But the cool thing about the way we are doing the live streaming is that you can actually log in, like we're gonna send you a private link and you can just log in whenever it's good for you and start from the beginning. You kind of watch the whole thing from the beginning um, or, and then you can jump to the, to the, you know, the live broadcast. For example, if you have a lunch break for an hour and 15 minutes, you can just like jump over that and kind of come closer to the real time and then eventually catch up with the real time. So I think that's pretty cool. And then it's also gonna be recorded so you can watch it uh, afterwards as well. Um, yeah, we, we didn't get any questions this time. Um, this is all right. Uh, maybe people are saving them for, for the weekend or maybe you were just so clear <laughs> on everything. So, so yeah. So thank you, Rudy and Jenny for taking the time to, to do this webinar. And yeah, I really look forward to meeting you in a couple of days. And also, thank you everyone who's who's watching this this webinar, and also everyone who's coming to to Unlimited in the weekend. I really really look forward to you know meeting you and connecting you and and, and chatting with you. And yeah, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun this weekend. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>